Hi, this is Fish and welcome to Fish Picks. If you've followed this channel for a while, you'll know the struggle I have had with the infamous American 1100. For months I worked on this lot to no avail, but then, over a 48-hour period, I not only achieved my first open, but went on to be able to open this lock in less than 20 seconds. What I learned in those two days can work for you too, and is transferable to many of the other locks you might find challenging to pick. So what are the eight steps that I took which made all the difference? Well, let's get into it. The American 1100 holds a special place in the lock sport community. It looks great, comes in a range of different colours which makes it very collectible, and after you've worked with them for a while, you'll come to see that they provide a really unique picking experience. Many identify this lock as one of their favourites to pick, and I'd now share that sentiment, but that wasn't always the case. For a couple of months I worried away at this lock and got nothing. Much of the advice I got from other pickers was similar. Use light tension. Don't press too hard because the pins are liable to overset. Test for the open now and again because the shackle spring is really heavy and you might not realise you've unlocked it. But despite these great tips, I couldn't get anywhere. I even went as far as to buy the Lishy 2-in-1 decoder for the AM5 keyway and couldn't even open it with this. The longer the situation went on, the more intimidating this lock became, and I started to wonder whether I might have met my match and that my picking progress had stalled. But then I got a message from Isaac Hashman, a Canadian picker who's racked up some impressive opens of high-end security locks and just recently set a new world speed picking record for the 1100 in 0 0.67 seconds. Isaac reached out and suggested that he might be able to help me, so we arranged a face-to-face -face call over Discord a couple of weekends ago. Now I have to say that I was initially sceptical. After all, lock picking is all about the feel of the pins, and how can that be communicated remotely? How wrong I turned out to be. Our call started about 8pm GMT, and went on till almost 1am, which speaks to just how badly I wanted to crack this lock, but also how patient and generous Isaac was with his time. He's a great coach, and he completely opened my eyes to the fact that having a good mentor can make a huge difference to how quickly we progress in this craft. So, the first of my eight recommended steps for opening the 1100, or indeed any lock you're struggling with, is not to be shy to ask help from others in the community and try to engage in a live conversation rather than rely upon the necessarily limited medium of forum chats. What I'm going to do now is take you through the other seven steps that Isaac taught me on that call. Step two involves a shift of focus. I currently own five American 1100s, and I'd often work on all of them in a session, switching between them in the hope that I'd have better luck with one than the others, but Isaac explained that my focus shouldn't be to open all 1100s, just one specific lock. We chose this one, which became the focus of my attention for the rest of the night. I was to become intimately familiar with this lock, the bitting on the key, the pins, their positions until I came to know this better than any other lock I own. Now, when I had mastered this specific lock, many of the skills I acquired along the way meant that my other 1100s became easier to open too, because those skills were transferable. But I wasn't to worry about that for now. I needed to concentrate on the riddle presented by this discrete locking mechanism, and this narrowing of my focus took some pressure off me, but also made me laser focused on the other steps to follow. Step 3. It's important that your pick profile will allow you to move each of the pins to the shear line without oversetting others in the process. The bitting on this particular lock is 33772. To set the high pin at the back of the core, I had to be able to get past the two low cuts in positions 3 and 4, and Isaac suspected that this might be part of the issue I was having, so I switched from the short hook that I had been using to a longer hook instead. By laying the pick against the key and mimicking the intended picking process from the back moving forward, I was able to visually check whether this new pick would work 
while also starting to lay down a mental blueprint of what would be going on inside the lock. Step 4. Isaac then asked me whether I could feel each of the pins in turn from the back of the core moving forwards and it became quickly clear that I couldn't. Like most beginners, my sensitivity to the feedback is still hit and miss, so he had me mark up my pick using a sharpie with the key as my reference. The process was very simple but made a huge difference to how accurate I could be in manipulating the pin stacks. First I placed the key in the lock and marked the point where the key profile met the edge of the lock body. Then, with the pick tip against the position of the fifth notch, I marked the pick at the point directly beneath that reference mark on the key. Then, pulling the pick back until the tip was now aligned with the notch for the fourth pin, I made the next mark on the pick and then repeated this for the other three notches too. The result was a pick with five reference points that I could use knowing that my pick was playing directly on each pin stack. Now I was able to identify which pin I was working on with more certainty. Step 5. Isaac now took me through the process of progressively pinning the lock. We started by gutting it and looking carefully at the key pins and the drivers in each position. I won't be going through how to gut and reassemble the 1100 in this episode. There are already several good channels which you can look to for guidance, although if you wouldn't like me to do a future tutorial on that topic, then just let me know in the comments and I'll see what I can do. In this case, we found the following. The key pins were all serrated, which is typical of the American 1100, and makes them liable to oversetting. And when we turned our attention to the driver pins, I found that at the front of the core we had a spool, Next was a serrated pin, then a spool, followed by another spool, and finally a serrated pin at the back of the lock. Now that I knew what was going on inside, I reassembled the lock but using just the pin stacks 4 and 5. This would give me practice at setting the high cut serrated pin and then working on the spool without having to worry about the other pins involved. I should point out that as a side benefit of this progressive pinning approach, I got a lot of experience in gutting and reassembling this model of lock and goodness knows I needed it. I made every mistake possible along the way. Springs were mashed, pins were dropped and I even put the core back into the lock body the wrong way around at one point. Isaac was infinitely patient and coached me through each of these mistakes in turn and now I'm so much more confident and quicker so for this reason alone, it was a worthwhile experience. With just the two pins in place, it wasn't long before I was successfully getting consistent opens, which built my confidence and began to give me a feel for what the 1100 feedback is like. I was able to dial in the amount of tension to apply and came to understand what an overset pin click sounds and feels like in comparison to bringing that pin to the shear line. One thing I noticed was that after I'd set the serrated pin in position 5, it didn't drop into a false set as I'd expected it to, given that only the spool now remained. This was because the low cut was such that the neck of the spool was already above the shear line, and so the pin was behaving like a standard rather than a security pin. This was also to be true of the next pin, which was also a spool sitting on a 7 cut. It's really easy to just assume that security pins will behave as you'd expect them to, but context is king, and the bitting can radically change the binding order and behaviour of each stack. It's important to work with what you're feeling and not what you expect to feel. So, having mastered two pins, now it was a case of gutting it again, putting in the third pin stack, reassembling it and starting over. This time working from the back of the stacks, so I got two clicks out of the serrated pin to take it to shear, just nudged the fourth pin with its spool and did the same thing for the third pin to affect the open. And guess what I did next? You've got it, I gutted it, added the serrated pin and key pin for the second stack and tried again. Each time I added a new stack it would take me a little longer to achieve the first open, but I was getting invaluable, managed experience without ever feeling like it was out of my reach. So finally, it was time to add the last pin back in. Now was the moment of truth. Could I pick a fully pinned 1100? This time, for the first time since working with this lock, I fell into a deep false set after I picked the back four pins. 
the spool on a three cut actually allowing the security pin to operate as it was designed to do. This presented a new challenge therefore I had to play with counter rotation without dropping the pins I'd already set. At first I couldn't get this right but I understood the nature of the problem and this made a big difference to my mindset and how I tackled the challenge. And this leads me to step six which is to take the time to really understand what the feedback is telling you. By this stage I knew this lock and its configuration of pins so well that I had a rock solid kinesthetic appreciation of what was happening at each stage of the picking process. I knew when I'd overset a pin and so needed to reset. I knew how pulsing my tensioner at certain times would help me to test a pin's current state and I knew exactly what I needed to do next. I had a game plan. When I came back to it the next day I still couldn't get it. In fact I had to take a couple of steps back and repin it for three and then four pins to reinforce the knowledge I'd acquired before putting that last pin back in. I chipped away at the problem throughout that second day, 20 minutes here, half an hour there and finally in the early evening of that second day I got my open and it was a sweet little victory. So that leaves us with just the last two steps to discuss. Step seven is that you need to be prepared to put in the hours. There is no substitute for spending time with a pick in your hands and working the problem. I have no idea how many times I picked this lock before I got my first open with all five pins but I put in the sweat equity and these tips I'm sharing with you made the learning journey more efficient but they're not shortcuts. It took patience and effort which is of course why achieving the open actually means something. And step eight is to then reinforce your initial success as soon as possible. So there you have it. That's how I managed to overcome my kryptonite lock and I've noticed that my picking has leveled up across the board since because of the lessons I learned whilst working on this project. It goes without saying that I'm so grateful to Isaac for his support and coaching and to all of you for your encouragement and advice along the way and I hope you've taken something useful away from this episode too. Thanks for listening and until next time, take good care.